All right. Uh, let's get started with what is our last lecture of the semester. Hey, we made it. Um, so first, let me just go over how the uh, rest of the semester is going to go down. So I have about a lecture and a half of stuff that uh, I really need to cover. Um, actually, two and a half, but we'll just say one and a half. Um, so what we're going to do, since you have a test on Wednesday, the half of the lecture that we didn't finish last week, Monday, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that's going to uh, appear on the final exam after thinking it over. Um, I really like to give people some, some days to um, prepare. Uh, so if, if you read through the whole PowerPoint and you have everything, fantastic. Um, that's going to show up on the final exam. If you haven't had the chance to look at this PowerPoint yet in your reviews, whatever, that's fine too. Um, you only need to know to a part of it. And I'll show you what part um, you, you need to know up to for our test on Wednesday. And like I said, the rest will just be on the final exam. For the other PowerPoint, um, for the PowerPoint that I'm supposed to cover today, um, I don't see us getting through all of that. However, it is very uh, important information for those of you who are thinking of going to like medical schools, uh, vet schools, dental schools, what have you. So what we're gonna do for that is I'm going to post a video uh, covering the rest of that lecture, whatever we don't finish. Um, and that will appear on the final exam. So, and it, it should only be like a half a lecture's worth. So I'll post that online. Uh, please watch it over uh, before you know you take the final exam. Um, and then if you have questions on that, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know. But hopefully it won't be uh, too complicated about that. Um, and I believe I posted the final exam date on Blackboard. And like I said on there, you'll have two days to take it. Uh, it is comprehensive. Um, I think the best way to study, um, since I get this question all the time, go through your tests, make sure you can answer those. Um, and they should be available, the tests should be available online, so make sure you can answer those questions. Go through the study guides. Um, and when you're looking at the study guides, uh, make sure you can answer those questions. If you can answer everything on the study guide and everything on the test, you should do fine. Um, you should have no problem with that. Uh, uh, can I open the submission for the lab report? Yes, I will do that since those are due tomorrow at midnight. So I will be sure to do that. Um, but any questions about the rest of the semester, um, how we're handling test four, how we're doing the final exam, anything like that? How many questions are going to be on the final? That's a good question. I do not know. I have not made it. Um, I will say you have two and a half hours. So I have never given a final at this university that no one has been able to finish. I'll say that. How many questions are gonna be on Wednesday's exam? Um, I'm almost done with my draft. So 22, 23 with like, 14 multiple choice and the rest short answer, something like that. Yeah, ballparkish. Any other questions? All right. Um, so let us get um, to our PowerPoint then. All right, so it's been a while uh, since you had class. And those of you who took in Turkey, hopefully all that tryptophan did not make you forget. But where we finished, I believe, I may have forgot, um, we were talking about kinetics. So we should know this equation. So we should know, let me just say, we should know that the information presented here, we should be able to answer this type of question. We should be able to answer this type of question. 
And I believe we should also be able to answer uh, this type of question as well, because this type of question just deals with the Michaelis-Menten equation as well. So if you know what the variables of the Michaelis-Menten equation are, you should be able to figure out how to answer something like this, where we're giving a maximum velocity, so that's V max, right? Um, if I run an experiment with initial velocity, that's V naught, um, with a substrate concentration, so that's S, no, and total enzyme ET, uh, what's KM, what's KCAT, what's catalytic efficiency? So make sure you can uh, utilize the Michael cement equation and, an and answer basic questions like this. Make sure you can read a graph, find KM, find Vmax. Starting from this slide, line weaver burke Anything past, including this and past this point, you will um, be tested on this on the final exam. So hopefully that's clear what you need to know by Wednesday, what you need to know by next week. All right, so let's get to it then. Um, so back in the day of kinetics, um, enzyme kinetics were first discovered in roughly 1920, 1930. Um, they did not have computers. And so if you look at a regular michaelis menten uh, a plot, well, let me go back to that. So if this was the plot you're looking at for a michaelis menten experiment, you did a real experiment and you got this. And you know how on Monday I said, ah, Vmax is probably five. That's not good enough for scientists. You can't just say, eh, Vmax is probably this. You actually actually have to have a specific answer for that. And so back in the day to solve for curves, what you would do is you would convert your curve into a line. And that's usually done through some uh, fancy mathematics. Uh, one sec, so I do have a question about the final. Will they all be the same, a few multiple choice and short answer? Um, that I don't know. Right now I'm debating between all multiple choice or majority multiple choice and few short answer. Um, yeah, I don't know yet. It's going to be heavily multiple choice either way, just because um, I have a lot to grade in a short amount of time. Anyways, back to line weaver Burke. The whole point of this is to make your curve into a line because once it's in a line, you have this. You have y equals mx plus b. That's your equation of a line. So what can we get from this? Well, if you have your kinetics equation in a line, you can get v max easily enough because that is your y-intercept. And you can actually get km because that's your x-intercept. And to be able to do this, you need to have special x, y axes. So what you do is on your x axis, right? You plot one over substrate concentration. On the y axis, you plot your data in the form of one divided by initial velocity. When you take a variable like velocity and you do one over velocity, that is called taking the reciprocal of that variable. And so line weaver burke is, it's called a double reciprocal plot. Both the X and Y axes are one over a variable. So that's why it's double reciprocal. And when you do this, you plot your uh, kinetics data. So each data point is a different experiment. Your X axis will be negative one over KM your y-axis will be one over v max. So let's say that your v max, or let's say when you did this on a line we were Burke, the y-intercept would be 0.25. So that would be one over v max equals one over four because one over four is 0.25. So v max is four. So to solve this, when you get your y-intercept, you just do one over whatever you got, and that will give you your v max. 
For Km, let's say you got negative five as your x-intercept. Well, to get Km, you do negative one over negative five, which is 0.2. So Km always positive. And that's a mistake I see a lot, is that even though the x-axis is one over km, or sorry, one over substrate, um, when you do this, you have to take the negative value because your x-intercept will always be a negative value. And your km can't be negative because remember, km is the amount of substrate you need to go to one half your maximum velocity. So you can't have a negative amount of substrate. So make sure when doing these calculations, you remember that and KM is always positive. All right, so that's a line weaver bert plot. That's the information you can get out of the line weaver bert plot. Oh, one more thing, slope is KM divided by B max. Um, but any questions about um, the information I just went over? Why is it always positive? Well, let's say that, well, okay. Because you can't have negative amount of stuff, right? So it's like, I need 10 gallons of gas to go 200, mile, 200 miles. That, and the equivalent of having a negative KM is saying like, I need minus five gallons of gas to go like a hundred miles. Like that doesn't make any sense. You can't have negative things. Negative numbers don't exist in reality. You can't have less than zero or something unless you have a bank account. But yeah, that's why. This substrate is making your enzyme work. How can I not have that substrate and still have my enzyme working? Remember, Km equals substrate concentration where your enzyme is going one half. So Km is the substrate concentration where you're going one half your maximum speed. That can't be a negative number. I can't have minus two grams of something. All right. So moving on then, here's a line weaver birth plot for you. Simply look at this and see if you can determine Km and Vmax. So I'll give people like a minute or two to look at this plot, see if you can tell me what you think Km and Vmax are. Oh, and I just realized the x-axis is uh, cut off. So the x-axis should say one over substrate in negative one millimolar.
All right, so let's see how we go about solving this. So remember that you find Km, oops, let me get my pen out. You find Km through the x-intercept, you can find Vmax through the y-intercept, right? And so um, here, our x-intercept is roughly negative 0.275, roughly. And our y-intercept is roughly 1.9. So to get Km, you take your x-intercept and you do a negative one over that, which is roughly 0 0.363 millimolar. And um, for Vmax, you do one over 1.9, V max is roughly 0 0.526, and this would be uh, micro. The unit doesn't make much sense on, sense on this plot, so it should be like micromole over like seconds, but it will work. I'm more interested in you knowing like how to find V max and KM from a uh, line mover Berg plot here. All right, so any questions? about that, that process. Uh, you do have to flip it. I flipped it in both cases, right? So the X intercepts like negative 2.75. So I did one divided by 2.75. The y-intercept was 1.9, so I did one over 1.9. Isn't that one over km? No, not km. No, the x-intercept is one over km. That's one over vmax. X intercepts one over KM, so whatever the value you find is one over KM. The Y intercepts one over Vmax. So by flipping it, you are finding KM. So this is KM, that's Vmax. All right, so moving on then. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about mechanisms. So um, up to this point in this class, we have always talked about enzymes just having one substrate, but um, enzymes can have two substrates. Usually they don't have three, um, usually it's two. Um, at the most, uh, tri-substrate, I guess, is theoretically possible, just super rare. Uh, four would be like incredibly rare. Um, but uh, there are a fair number that are bisubstrates. In fact, 60% of all reactions, right? And when you're talking about an enzyme that are bisubstrates or using two substrates, there's only a few mechanisms that enzymes use. Uh, the first type is called se sequential. And sequential simply means that the substrates bind, both substrates bind before a product is made. So that's what sequential is. And yet two types of sequential. Ordered sequential means that one substrate always binds before the second one. So in our example here, a will always bind to the enzyme to form our enzyme plus substrate A complex. And only after A is bound will B be bound. That's different than random. Random is A or B can bind in any order. And when we look at the products in order, what usually happens is that a product will always come off. So the product P, then the other product will come off, Q. While in random, again, 
it's any order. P could come off first or Q could come off first. And, and just, just so I get this question sometimes too, A, B, P, and Q are just random molecules. It really doesn't matter what they are. They're just placeholders for, for uh, uh, a molecule. So sequential, um, both substrates have to bind. If it's ordered, they have to follow a pattern, a set pattern or set order. If it's random, they can bind and come off in any, any combination. And compare that with uh, ping pong or called double displacement. So these names are easy. Ping pong is substrate binds, product comes off. Substrate binds, product comes off. So ping pong, ping pong, substrate product, substrate product. And the way to determine a sequential versus a ping pong mechanism is that you have to do experiments. So you can do some, some kinetic experiments and just, just see, you know, what is my enzyme doing? Is it doing a sequential mechanism or is it doing a ping pong mechanism? Can A and B in change position? You mean in ping pong? Um, once it's set, it, it can't. So like, if this was my mechanism, then B can't come in first, right? Um, and, and we know this because if you look at the, at the bottom here, when A binds to enzyme E, you make an enzyme E complex. And this F is saying like different form of enzyme E. Whoops, different form of enzyme B. So um, like the enzyme went through a different conformational change or as a slightly different chemical group in the active site now or, or something like that. And in the F form, now it can bind um, substrate B, right? So once the mechanism is set, like B can't come in first. So no, they can't change position. All right, so here's some critical thinking questions for us. And I do have a poll for this, but let me just read, read this out so you can take a minute to sub, uh, think about it. So I have a bisubstrate reaction and I have a reaction that has P and I label it with some kind of marker so I can tell, like let's say I'm using carbon 13 as a marker or something. So it's radioactive carbon that I put in my product. And I add this to enzyme. So in a test tube, I have P, I have enzyme E, and I have substrate A. I don't have B, and I don't have Q. And my question is, if I run this experiment with just label P, my enzyme, and regular A, will I see labeled A. That is, will my carbon 13 that I put in P, will that eventually be incorporated into A? So let me make a poll or let me put up the poll so I can get um, everybody's thoughts on this. So the poll is simple. Do you think my product A based on this scenario will be labeled or do you think it will not be labeled?
do about 30 more seconds since we have the majority of people in. All right, so the majority of us said A will be labeled. So let's take a look at this logic. If I start with E, A, E, and P. So I start with A, E, and P in a test tube. And P is labeled. What can happen is that E, A can bind with our enzyme. And now make F an unlabeled product. Well, what can happen then is that our labeled product can interact with the enzyme version of F we just made and make A that is labeled plus enzyme version E. So in this mechanism, and in any enzyme really, you can go backwards. Right? So that's why I just drew these arrows showing that you can go backwards at any step. So P can go backwards to A as long as we have the enzyme version F available. Well, if I start with substrate A in enzyme version E, like I said, that will make enzyme version F. Once enzyme version F is around, that can interact with the labeled product we already have and make labeled A. So the correct answer, as the majority of us got was, yes, um, we can make uh, A be labeled. So A will be labeled. Any questions about that logic? All right, if not, yeah, one more question, I believe. Same idea. In a bisubstrate reaction, I got a poll for this as well. In a bisubstrate reaction, a small amount of the first product P is labeled. So we start with P and it's labeled. And I add that to the enzyme in the first substrate A. So I have E and I have A as well. So same setup. I don't have B or Q, no B, no Q. Will A be labeled if we follow a sequential mechanism? Will A be labeled if we follow a sequential mechanism? All right, so let me get this poll up now. Let's see what, let's see what we think. Do about 30 more seconds. All right. So the majority of us said a will not be labeled. So let's, let's take a look at this. Sequential, which means A and B both have to be bound for a reaction to happen. So that's a forward reaction. 
or P and Q have to be bound to do the reverse reaction. So we only have A, we only have E, and we only have P. So I can't go forward to make P and Q without substrate B, which we don't have. And I can't go backwards to make A and B without substrate Q, which we don't have. So this reaction, what I have in my test tube, is not, not enough to actually have a reaction. So P, our labeled P, would never react with our enzyme. Therefore, no, we would not make labeled A. So we would, it would not be labeled. All right, so any questions about that idea? All right, um, so we will go on to the next PowerPoint then. That was an interesting time to kick me off. We were done with the PowerPoint anyways. So um, let's go on to the next PowerPoint. And in case I was cut off, the answer was it would not be labeled. All right, last PowerPoint of the semester. Yay, we did it. And what we're talking about now are inhibitors. So we talked um, with the last PowerPoint, um, we talked all about, you know, an enzyme just working. Now let's talk about how we can stop an enzyme. And so stopping an enzyme with the molecule, um, that's called an inhibitor. So an inhibitor will reduce an enzyme to activity. Um, while if the molecule completely stops the enzyme and the enzyme can never recover, we call that an inactivator. So an inhibitor can be reversed, an activator, an activator can't, and an activator is permanent. So I guess, you know, an inhibitor is like a pencil, can be erased, an activator is permanent marker, that can't be erased. And we're gonna focus on inhibitors and there's um, some different inhibitors. Um, we're first gonna talk about competitive inhibitors and what a competitive inhibitor does is that it will compete with the substrate to bind at the binding site. So the binding site is where the substrate goes and binds. The competitive inhibitor will try to bind there as well, preventing the substrate to bind. And your best competitive inhibitors look like your normal substrate. And so that's, that's the pictures we have down here. Um, for succinate dehydrogenase, it works on succinate. A competitive inhibitor is malinate. Um, they look very similar with the difference of one CH2 unit. So malinate can bind, but you'll have no reaction. So this is a competitive inhibitor. Um, and so some other types of inhibitors we have, we have product inhibition. Um, what, what product inhibition is, is that you have so much product, um, you will bind the active site and stop the reaction. And this happens in your body naturally all the time, um, especially in um, glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. So if you, right after lunch, your body is full of ATP because you just ate, right? And so what's gonna happen since you're full of ATP, uh, gluconeogenesis will stop. Um, gluconeogenesis is a process of making glucose and it stops because you have so much citric acid and ATP in your, in your cell. Um, there's a nice preview of Biochem 2 for you. Um, but yeah, that's product inhibition. Another way we can have inhibition is through transition state analogs. And what transition state analogs are, 
is that they will bind the transition state. And these are your best inhibitors, should be no surprise, all right? Because an enzyme wants to bind the transition state. So if your molecule looks like the um, transition state or looks like the transition state, your enzyme will bind that and it will not be able to work. So here we have a question. Uh, molecule, uh, so substrate X works on molecule A, not molecular A, molecule A. Therefore, what do you think would be a competitive enzyme or competitive inhibitor of X, B or C? So let me pull up a poll because this is a just a 50-50 shot. What do you think would work best to inhibit enzyme X, molecule B or molecule C? And give like a minute for this. All right, and the majority of us got it. It is molecule B because it looks most like molecule A um, with the only difference of being a methyl so that's COO minus. Um, molecule C might work, but it's so much bigger than molecule A um, that it probably won't bind that well. So to be a very good inhibitor you wanna look as close as possible to the substrate with maybe like one difference, one or two differences. And this big ring here is probably too big of a difference that your enzyme won't bind it. Cause adding a giant phenol ring to a molecule um, is, a, is a big change when if it was, if it was just COO minus instead. That's why it's B. All right, so let's look at, um, the, the equations of uh, inhibition. So let me just rewrite what's down here. EI plus S make no reactions. All right. Um, so some things we have to, uh, um, some terms, we have to get down for this. First is the inhibition constant, Ki. Um, and what Ki is, it's called a dissociation constant. And what a dissociation constant is, and you're, if you go to biochemistry, molecular biology, anything like that, you talk about dissociation constants all the time. And it's the complex on the denominator and the individual things on the numerator. So it's free enzyme multiplied by free inhibitor complex, so not bound on the numerator, divided by the enzyme inhibitor complex on the denominator. And Ki's dissociation constants, the smaller that is, the stronger the binding, because it's a fraction, right? So the, big, the bigger the denominator, the smaller the fraction. The bigger the denominator, the more enzyme uh, enzyme inhibitor complex you have, the better your inhibitor works. So uh, smaller numbers, stronger binding. And when we look at uh, the Michaelis-Menten equation for initial velocity, when we talk about competitive inhibitors, we put this alpha multiplied by Km. And what this alpha is, it's, it's one plus free inhibitor divided by our Ki equation, which we just talked, divided by our inhibition constant. 
And we actually have a term for this alpha KM. We call it KM apparent or the apparent Michaelis constant. And A alpha will always be a value greater than one. And because what a competitive inhibitor does is that it increases KM, but does not change Vmax. So KM will increase Vmax, no change, right? And we can understand this by looking at our reaction here. So let's just focus on the top down here. And, and I guess I'll get my uh, spotlight out because I don't need the right. So we have enzyme plus substrate goes to enzyme substrate makes product plus enzymes. That's our Michaela's Menten equation. For a competitive inhibitor, I bind at the same site. So I have a second equation. Enzyme plus inhibitor make our enzyme inhibitor complex. And I, if I try to add substrate, there's no reaction that happens. And the speed of this reaction is Ki. Now, why does Vmax not change? The reason why Vmax doesn't change is because this inhibitor and this substrate are competing for the same place. So if I just have a lot of substrate, let's, let's put random numbers to this. Let's say I have, I don't know, 1 million molecules of substrate versus 10 molecules of inhibitors. I have so much substrate and then we can actually say, let's say 100 molecules. I have so much substrate that my inhibitor is not able to compete. So I can outcompete my inhibitor and reach my maximum velocity, right? So that's why Vmax doesn't change. I can always beat my inhibitor if I have enough substrate. All right, so why does Km increase then? So remember Km, is the amount of substrate need to go one half V max. The reason why that increases is because now I'm competing. So I need more substrate to go my maximum velocity. And I need more substrate to go to one half my maximum velocity, right? So that's why we see no change with V max, but an increase with Km they are competing for the same spot. All right, questions about that information. And what does this look like on a line weaver burke plot then? Uh, so on a line weaver burke since Vmax doesn't change, your non-inhibitor, which is this greenish line, and your inhibitor, which are blue and purple, they cross at the same point on the y-intercept because that's Vmax. However, Km is different. So Km will get closer to zero because Km is increasing. Um, that might not seem like it makes much sense to you. Um, remember, we're doing one over Km, right? So if my, let's say for my normal, my normal no inhibitor, Km is one. My inhibitor one, Km increases, so it's two. So inhibitor one, and then for inhibitor two, let's say my Km is four. Well, if I'm doing the reciprocal of this, one divided by one is one, one divided by two is 0.5, one divided by four is 0.25. So as your Km becomes bigger, it gets closer to zero. 
So that's why we see our inhibitor line shifting towards zero on the x-intercept. So that's what the line weaver Berg looks like for competitor. Uh, any questions about that? All right, so how much more do I have to have? Let's see. So I have two more inhibitors to know and just some uh, example questions to go over that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'll just, uh, um, I'll call it right here and I will probably make these either on Tuesday or Wednesday where I'll just like make like a 15 minute video to just go over uh, uncompetitive, mixed, and then I'll work out these problems. Um, so you know uh, how to handle this for the uh, final exam. Otherwise, um, like I said, this is our last lecture. So um, make sure you start it hard for test four. Um, and if you have any questions concerning test four or the final exam, I am always available. Do we get a formula sheet for test four? Um, I think the only equation you know is Michaelis, need to know is Michaelis Menten. And I'm probably not gonna ask you what the Michaelis Menten equation is. So sure, I can make that for you. Um, I don't know how useful it will be, but yeah, I can give you the Michaelis Menten equation. Oh, any other equations we need, I guess. Oh, rate enhancement. I forgot about those questions because I haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah, I'll give you any, any equation we went over in class. I'll put that on a sheet. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't got to that part of making the exam yet. So that's why I slipped my mind. Yep, so you, you'll probably see that on Tuesday. Um, what I will ask for you though is please don't like, and I guess I'm going to use the, the, um, uh, the honor system here. Look, I know how he, using Proctor U now, like for eight different tests between two classes, um, it's not as foolproof as I thought um, in that it's easy to bypass stuff if you really want. So if you could just do me a favor and not write on your equation sheet, what labels everything out. And maybe saying that now I'm going to change my, the way I was going to ask my questions. So it wouldn't be that obvious. Um, so just try not to write right on the equation sheet. That would be great. Um, that's all I ask. When will exam, you mean exam four? Yeah, exam four is gonna be the same thing. Wednesday, 12 a.m., 12 p.m. As normal, December 2nd, which is the last day of classes. All right, any other questions? Well, if not, I will post this online. You do have one more homework assignment due next week, Sunday, um, to cover the stuff we went over today. Uh, I, I think I'll actually put up a few questions for the stuff we don't. We I will put in the video on, on I'll probably make on Tuesday or Wednesday, just so you have it there to practice. That'll be due Sunday. Um, other than that, hope you learned some stuff this semester. Um, if you have any questions, any once you lead this class about anything biochem related or anything like that, please don't hesitate to send me an email, even if it's like five years from now. And hopefully I'm still working here. We'll see, maybe not. But if I am, feel free to use my same email and I'll be happy to chat with biochem anytime. What about the extra credit you sent in? Um, I will look at that and I will um, apply it. I'm not sure how I'm gonna apply it, but I have it. Um, so if you did it, um, I will think about how best to use that. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. All right. Um, study hard, everybody. Almost done. And I will see everybody later. Have a good one.